After exploring Petra, we took a short bus ride from Wadi Musa to the capital of Jordan, Amman. So we're at Hashem restaurant, and apparently it's famous, and there's pictures of like the royal family up here that have eaten here. So I guess it's, you know, royal family famous. And it's just a hummus place. And um, the falafel and hummus and pita and tea, same standard affair. But it's amazing how good this really basic meal can be. Um, there's like a pepperzini juice on the hummus. I've never tasted that that strongly before in a hummus. So that's exciting to say the least. So here's a new one for you. We've done, we've been to a lot of places where they did some really random things that were kind of gross. But this one is, is pretty high up on the list for me because I sit down at the table, they've got free water right there. God, I would love, love to drink that water. You ask them for a cup and they will point to the cups that are already on the table. And that means those are communal cups. They put them on the table at the beginning of the day and they take them off the table at the end of the day. So everyone, yeah, maybe. Um, so everyone that you see using them is basically drinking from the same cup that everyone at this table drank from earlier. So if that guy's got a cold that was here two hours ago or whatever. Can a cold stay on a cup for two hours? Tests help. Anyways, like, it's just really, really gross, so I don't get any water. That sucks. Okay, so it's our first real day in Amman, and we're walking up this gigantic hill to go to the citadel, and we notice all these balloons in the air that have a note attached to them. And you can see one right there. And we were gonna try and figure out what the note said. But I don't think that balloon's ever gonna take off. Maybe we'll find out. But there are a bunch in the sky over here. You can't really see them because the camera's probably not that good. There goes one. What do they say? Hmm. All right, so this is what we found out. Apparently some kids are sending off talking balloons. <laughs> Yasmin, a third grader, loves her teacher, says that her teacher is her mom and that her teacher is a flower. Lots of love, many, many hearts. So we're picking this guy up out of the rubble that was down there and hopefully we can send him off in a better way. You wanna do the honors? <laughs> Not enough helium in this balloon. Yeah, the paper is too heavy. Yeah. Oh well. <laughs> I did my best. And these are Eric's pants. I've sewn them up. I think I've spent like six hours total sewing these pants up. And they still just kind of look like garbage because the moment that he sits down, they just split. I look good. Yeah, he looks good. We got what, 18 days? Mm -hmm. 16 days, something like that? You think they'll last? No. We're gonna be busting out everywhere. Try to, try to keep it in. No promises. So I wouldn't call Amman one of my favorite looking cities, but it definitely is unique looking. Um, it's like a Middle Eastern city crossed with San Francisco. It's, it's sort of built on a hill. And you can see everything over here is up on another hill. And it's kind of dirty and it's kind of clean. And I don't know, it feels like Cairo and San Francisco and Muscat all got together and hung out. And this, that's another one of the world's largest flagpoles. I actually think this is bigger than the one that we saw down in Aquaba. It's all very confusing, I'm not sure. Our book is very uh, bad at informing you on accurate facts, I believe. So it likes to call everything the biggest flagpole. So this is the Amman Citadel, and it is a collection of ruins from like 1500 to 2000 years ago, maybe even longer. Like for instance, well this is only 1500 years old. This thing says the Byzantine church from about 550 AD. So this used to be a church and now it's just a bunch of rubble. And um, there is this thing over here. I don't know what it is. I don't know what any of this is. Wait, it is what? Katie thinks it might be an amphitheater, like a small indoor amphitheater. 
audience hall, domed audience hall. So there you go, you've learned something. And then there's just like, this is actually pretty cool. I'm gonna get a better shot of that in a minute. So uh, maybe I'll put that here, you can look at it. And this is just, um, it's a cool place. Like this is the highest hill in town and you can see all of the cool architecture and all of the cool buildings. Amman is really cool looking. It's just a big cluster of stuff on a hill, on many hills. It looks great. I really like it. So here's a little archway and uh, see if I can support Katie in her. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look at those physics. Katie's taking pictures for this lady. Got ourselves a model. <laughs> couple things of note that's going on here is Katie is looking amazing on this edge with the city and you may be able to hear call to prayer is going off right now and it's coming from about a hundred directions so it's pretty trippy sounding <laughs> it's just so much reverb and just bouncing through the hills and this is a I don't remember the date basically this is a well um, they would fill it with water, and 730 AD is when this was constructed, or around then. Um, they would fill this with water, and apparently it used to be full of plaster. Like down at the bottom of the stairs, you can still see it a little bit, but it used to be full of a waterproof plaster. This would be filled with water, and then they would use, like, there's a hole down there, and that would push the water, the pressure obviously, would push the water out, and it worked for the public baths and latrines and different things in the area. This thing's pretty impressive looking on the inside. Let's go in, shall we? Come on, check it out. It's cool. Oh, okay. The dome of this vestibule is a modern recreation. The original dome's interior would have been painted and plastered, so it would have looked a lot different than this gorgeous wooden architecture that they have up now. Needless to say, it's pretty neat. So this is that dome that's on top of that building. And I don't think I'm supposed to be up here. I kind of climbed a wall. Katie's trying to figure out how to get here. We split up, like, trying to figure out how to get to the top. And uh, <laughs> I don't know where she went. Ah, there she is. She found the same path I found. Okay, yeah, we definitely aren't supposed to be up top there. And um, I came down to take some pictures of Katie. Well, she was up there and a security guard came into this room and I was on the other side out there and he came out looking pretty suspicious like and he was gonna walk out and he, like he could tell I was taking pictures of somebody up there and he came out and he was like kind of snooping around and she was still like right above us and I was like hello, hello and talking to him and stuff and he distracted him and he eventually just started smoking a cigarette and sat down so <laughs> uh, sometimes you got to break out the social skills to distract the man The area that we're standing in is the Temple of Hercules. Not much more than a couple of columns and a little bit of rubble, but it's still kind of cool to know that somebody was here going, gosh, Hercules is awesome. Let's build a temple. <laughs> so you leave the Umayyad area and you come into the Roman area and it just, everything gets much, much bigger, much bigger. <laughs> So you can see a lot of like Roman uh, era leftovers, <laughs> ruins, I guess. There's a big amphitheater down here. And then there's this like, this whole area was apparently like administrative or something like you'd meet for different types of diplomatic purposes. So it's pretty cool to look down on it. And then you get the rest of modern Amman, which is just really astonishing looking. We're at this little museum in Amman, and um, in here they've got some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Which is kind of astonishing. I didn't expect to find something of such importance here. But um, these are these copper plates that they found, and they were like the only scriptures that they found at the Dead Sea that were made of a metal instead of some sort of like fabric or um, you know, some other type of material. I mean, it's just strange to have something carved into copper. And um, they apparently show like a city name and street name 
and its locations of treasures around the Palestinian region. Um, and if everything is taken at face value, this is basically a treasure map that shows a collection of things that's worth around a billion dollars. So that's pretty interesting. Um, there's three sheets here. The first one over here, of course. Number two. Number three. Apparently, from what I read, um, whoever actually wrote these probably didn't read or understand the language. It seems like they were transcribed, like they looked at something else and then wrote down what they think, like like they copied the shapes basically, like if you took and wanted to write Korean or something, you just look at it and kind of make the shapes, you wouldn't know what it meant. And it's just obvious by some of the mistakes that were made. Don't know how true that is, but that's just what I just read on the uh, on the old Wikipedia. But um, I'm pretty surprised in this little museum to have found something like this. Um, the museum's a lot, I mean, it's like, it looks kind of dumpy, but it's actually really good. They have a lot of stuff from, I mean, there's a lot of history in this part of the world, so it's got a lot of stuff from a lot of time periods. It's pretty interesting stuff. Lots of old, like, Greek coins and stuff from uh, Islamic age, and, I mean, they've got, like, this skull over here. Oh, let me show you this skull over here. It's pretty crazy. The skull, you see these holes in the top? That's from surgeries that were done on it during, you know, not quite not quite prehistoric age, but I mean a long time ago, like caveman style type stuff. But you can see there's four holes and this one is healing. So they lived through that, but the other three probably uh, they didn't live long after those surgeries were done. But most likely they just did that to release spirits or maybe something logical like blood clots or uh, blood pooling in the skull from like a, a getting hit or something but um, <laughs> I don't think I'd want somebody drilling up in my head 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago not a good time through our hotel we arranged a rental of a taxi for the day which we split with two other travelers a girl from Japan and another American from Boston on this day trip, we went to Madaba to see the oldest known map of the Middle East, to Mount Nebo to see the point where Moses viewed the Promised Land and subsequently died, and then to the Dead Sea to float around in one of the saltiest bodies of water at the lowest dry point on Earth. We finished up the day with a really strange beer run for our taxi driver. We're in Madaba, and we are at St. George's Church, and what you are looking at right here is a tile mosaic of a biblical map of the Middle East. It's said to be one of the oldest and one of the best sources of knowledge for biblical history. It's pretty beautiful and I haven't been in a church in a very, very long time. So this is a weird feeling and it's kind of nice to be in a church that's old and rustic and it's just kind of nice. We are hanging out on Mount Nebo. This is the second trip of our day trip that we're taking. Second stop, I mean. And uh, the view from Mount Nebo is pretty amazing. And this mountain is said to be where Moses saw the promised land. Not really sure what he was looking at or whatever. Eric may be able to give us more information on that later. <laughs> okay. The famous view of the promised land from Mount Nebo now overlooks modern day Jericho in the West Bank. According to religious texts, after escaping from slavery in Egypt and leading the exodus of the Israelites, Moses and his band of Jews wandered the desert for 40 years in search of the Promised Land. We did the same journey in a couple of days, by the way. Cars and maps are pretty awesome. Anyways, upon reaching the region Mount Nebo is in, Moses told everyone to go on ahead because he knew he would not be allowed access into the Promised Land. So he climbed up Mount Nebo to get a look at it, and then died on his 120th birthday. God personally buried him up there, and now the Middle East is a mess because so many people lay claims to the same strip of desert, largely based on the ideas behind the story. Thanks, Moses. One amazing thing, that's the Dead Sea. I am, I'm stunned. I mean, it's just a pool of water from here, but I know what it is. <laughs> I'm really excited. That's where we'll be going next. 
Okay, so um, swimming in the Dead Sea on this side, you kind of have to go to like a little resort place from what we can tell, and that's what we've done. So we're at a resort with a swimming pool, and that's the Dead Sea. And it's actually going to be decent, I think, because we'll be able to go get really, really, really super salty and then um, wash off and then come back and get in the pool. So seems all right. And um, momentarily, we will be down there, and I guess I will make some more video then. So uh, wait just a second. You can already see the people floating. This is so exciting. Yosha, are you excited? Are you excited? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so we are in the Dead Sea. And Katie's gonna step back and go into the depths. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! <laughs> I feel like we're at Willy Wonka's whatever. <laughs> yeah, it feels like so. Yeah, put your feet down, it's hard. Yeah. Here, show me. I'm not standing, it's just floating. Like my feet are not touching, I'm just floating straight up. It's so strange. <laughs> Okay, so it's weird. It's really weird. Like, it's hard to like explain. <laughs> it's really you're just very buoyant, obviously. And when you put your you like put your feet down, they like they want to pop back up. Um, so it's a really interesting feeling in general. And all the cuts on your body like burn, like because all the salt like gets into your gets into your skin. And now that I'm out of the water, my skin feels really it's kind of nasty actually. <laughs> so. I'm going to put the camera away, and then I'm going to go back and play around with it some more. But I haven't got my face wet, and apparently that's a good thing. So I got a little bit in this eye, and it hurts a lot. Got a little bit of the water. A little bit of the water, and then I've gotten it on my mouth a little bit. So I lick my lips, and it is possibly the worst flavor I have ever had in my mouth. It's like, oh, oh, it's really, really atrocious. This tastes nothing like salt. This tastes like sludge or something. So that's good to know, right? It's like being between gravity and anti-gravity. Like, I, I can't touch the ground, it won't let me, but I can't fly. <laughs> I kind of just stuck in the middle. and. <laughs> I like, like it. <laughs> and like you can, you can, you can swim. Like my body is vertical, like this right now, right? Like, and I'm not touching the ground. But you can swim by like walking and moving your arms. So like. Might be able to see that. Yeah. I don't we're not touching the ground at all. You just, you're just floating. It's really, really strange. Your skin feels weird. If you rub your skin, it feels slimy a little bit. When you get, uh, I got out, and when you get out, you can feel the salt all over you. Just little grains like on every single bit of your body. <laughs> yeah. All right, so here's a little bit more of Dead Sea information. This point right now where I'm standing is the lowest point on earth. And um, apparently the barometric pressure is really high here, so it stops UV radiation from getting through and does different things of that nature. And I'm not sure if I mentioned it <laughs> or not, but the water is actually air temperature. It's almost hotter when you're here, like towards the edge. When you get out there, it gets about the same temperature as the air. So that's a pretty fun, um, pretty fun uh, thing to experience. And Katie is about to cover herself in mud. And we'll see how this goes. This could be. This is this is dirty. <laughs> I was not expecting that. <laughs> we'll be back to this in a minute. So they've got these big piles of mud over here in these buckets, and it's pretty warm and kind of squishy and yucky. It's it's mud. And uh, you put it on your body, and I'm not sure what it does. I guess it exfoliates or whatever. 
it comes from the Dead Sea. There's a lot of Dead Sea products out there, so I guess that's kind of what they're playing off of. I'm just playing off the fact that I get to throw mud all over myself and nobody thinks it's weird. Um, so you put it on, you sit around for 15 minutes, and then you hop in the water and you wash it all off. And in the meanwhile, you look like a badass. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it, smells like it smells like burning rubber. All right, submerge. Really? Yeah. Ah. Ugh. <laughs> it's really nasty. Fuck that hurts. Okay. If you ever wanted to know how much it hurts to get Dead Sea water in your eyes, it hurts really fucking bad. <laughs> oh god. Don't keep touching them. I got it. <laughs> Is it in both of them? Yeah. <laughs> Again, not touching the bottom, just bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> this might be my favorite part. <laughs> no, no more movement. Still bouncing. <laughs> Okay, so I have a water bottle that's empty, essentially. Probably could be empty air, but whatever. I'm going to fill it up with water from the Dead Sea. And then I'm going to dry it. Like, let it sit out and evaporate and see how much salt is left. And because I'm sure you're wondering, any ex extracurricular appendages definitely are very buoyant in this water. Okay, so we were sitting in the car and uh, the driver asked me, he was like, beer run. And I thought, what? What are you talking about? And I couldn't figure out what he was saying. And uh, he got a guy on the phone that explained to me that, he, that the driver wanted to go get some beer, but he couldn't buy it by himself. So uh, we need to go with him to get the beer. We all initially thought that we were going to a bar and he was going to get beer and we were all going to drink together, but it turns out that we've come to this duty-free shop and uh, we've gone in and loaded up on Amstel beer. Like a lot. <laughs> like, um, he got uh, 26 Amstel beers. <laughs> I took a picture of it. I'll put the picture in here. Yeah, and uh, we've just loaded them all up into the, uh, the boot here, and we're heading on our way now. <laughs> we've done the beer run. <laughs> it's really strange. Like, we had to go in there. They stamped part of our passport to go and do this. So, it's really strange, and they won't sell it to him. And they checked the trunk and everything. It was really, really strange, but still very funny. Juicebox is going to get his drink on. <laughs> I didn't make a video about this earlier, I'd forgotten, but um, after we got out of the Dead Sea, we like rinsed ourselves off and then got into a normal swimming pool. And like you get into that water and you, you seriously feel like you're drowning. Like, because you, you've become accustomed after the hour that you spent in the Dead Sea to floating that you, you, it's, it's almost scary the way you like, you feel like, it, the, you feel heavy, like really strangely heavy. So um, that was a strange side effect I didn't expect to have. But um, if you go in the Dead Sea, definitely get in a pool afterwards if you have, if you can, because it's just really a strange sensation. So there's lots of pastry shops in this part of the world. So we came in here and we got these things. And Katie's reaction is... It's good. It's kind of like a big ho-ho. It's a big ho-ho. It's a big ho-ho that you can tell was cooked well. 
That's a good review, I suppose. So this place supplies PETA's devices, and you can see up here, PETA's are just raining down upon this man. <laughs> Okay, so this is Dead Sea water, and this is a little cup, and we're going to put a little bit of the water in the cup, and as an experiment, we will see how much salt is left when that evaporates. That might take a while to evaporate. You can already see the crystals yeah. that are on the edge of the bottle. <laughs> yeah, you can. So, it's really quite a bit of water, but we have a couple of days here. We will set it there. So we've taken a bus out of Amman and we are up at Jarash and we're going to check out Jarash and these ruins and we might go to a chariot race. I'm not sure. I'm <laughs> just uh, going to see how the day rolls. Okay, so this is the gate going into the old area of Jarash and it's basically, Jarash is basically just an old Roman city that after being raided by the, the Persians and raided by the Muslims and then an earthquake, etc., etc., the typical line of destructive succession has um, destroyed the city and it was abandoned for a long time after being a trade route for a, quite, a, quite a long time for the Romans. But there is a large amphitheater style building in here that could seat 15,000 people and that's supposedly like feet away from me somewhere just right over here and um, I'm not sure what else we'll see here but we're gonna check it out we're hoping to see like I said we're hoping to see some chariot races because they started doing them in 2005 it's basically like a reenactment and um, it's supposed to be as accurate as possible I mean who knows what that actually means but um, it would be kind of cool to see and that happens in a couple of hours so we'll see how this pans out Okay, so it's going to be two hours before we have the opportunity to see the, um, the chariot races and stuff. I kind of think it's going to be kind of like, like medieval times is kind of what I'm expecting, something similar to that. So um, no food though, so uh, I'm not sure aside from the entertainment what the attraction is, but we're going to do it. And this is, I'm standing where they have it. Like they just let you, like the, since it's not going on, I can walk out here. And you can see all the seating and stuff is up there. I'm not so certain that this is exactly what used to seat 15,000 people. Maybe that's someplace else. Maybe I misread, but <laughs> if it's 15,000 people, it's a lot of people sitting on each other's laps. So we now entered the kind of the main complex, and Katie tells me that this here is the Temple of Zeus. And keep in mind, this is all like, like a, this is like a Roman city, like straight up. So, um, I mean, it, all the archways and pillars, and it's, um... It's hard to wrap your mind around what you're actually looking at, to be honest. Apparently Column's construction was very robust because it's about all that's left. Let's see way out here in the distance. Columns. Columns. Here's like an amphitheater style building and it is packed full of tourists. A huge, huge group of tourists has walked out. And here's more tourists. <laughs> it's pretty neat though, it's in pretty good shape. These tends to, these ting, these construction types tend to stay in pretty good shape because I think they don't have a roof, so the roof didn't collapse on it and crush everything else. It's pretty interesting how high up I am, but like the guy from the acoustic middle of the stage, you can hear him clearly. Like He's not even really, he's not talking to me, he's just talking to people around him, and I can hear him, like, perfectly. It's really uh, interesting how well-constructed this is for such means. And I think they said that this uh, can hold 3,000 people. So, it's pretty big. Okay, so this is, like, the main roadway that came through this part of the town. And as you can see, um, lots of columns and stuff are still here. But the thing that I thought was really fascinating is the ground. This is the original, like, the original stonework from when it was built 2,000 years ago. And the ruts from chariots, like, my foot is in the rut from a chariot wheel, are still, like, very visible in the ground. And that's uh, pretty real. 
This is a second theater. And you can see that the floor has actually got some color in it where the last one did not. Seems about the same size. Maybe a, I don't know, a bit smaller or a bit bigger than the last of the same. Seems a little smaller. Maybe a little smaller, yeah. And uh, this character up here, this is Matt, by the way. We've been hanging out with him for two days now. I'm sure you wouldn't be able to tell, but my voice echoes a lot standing here, and Katie said she can hear me at this volume. Hello. It's pretty strange sounding, actually. This is very similar to the, um, I don't remember the real name, but they call it the vertical runway that was built in Vientiane in Laos. So if you remember that video, um, I can imagine that that type of thing is probably fashioned off something like this. This may sound a little odd, but there's evidence that bagpipes originated in the Middle East as far back as 1000 BC. We saw groups of bagpipe players at a couple of different tourist spots in Amman. This is one of them. but I haven't seen a chariot yet. Let's see how this pans out. The chariots have arrived. race and like they have like a presentation of like a Roman army and gladiators and stuff it's actually pretty fun it's kind of silly but um, not too silly and it's kind of serious but not too serious so it was a good time were good. Yeah. they had fights and they were pretty good they were fully going at each other it was nice <laughs> so this fruit juice thing is amazing it's like I don't even know. It's just made of heaven and honey and all sorts of deliciousness. And um, it costs, I guess, how much is this? This is one and a half, so that makes it like two dollars or something. So it's a little expensive, but I mean, for what it is, I mean, it's like a solid chunk of juice. It's basically a meal. There's something odd about this part of the world. Like, I ordered this tea. And. I'm here for shawarma and I ordered this tea and it came from down the road like they called somebody and he delivered it. You know, I see people like carrying like plates of tea down the street like all the time. Something we've noticed a lot in Egypt and so, so, so some uh, somewhat in Jordan. But um, why can't they just get hot water and a tea bag here? I have no idea. <laughs> just how it works. So this Japanese guy here that's eating with these girls, he's just trying some of their food. He has been, um, his name is Nov. And when we came over from Egypt, and that was like a week ago, I guess, he was on the boat with us, and we just kind of stuck together. And then we got off the boat and went separate directions, and like almost on a daily basis, we have seen him like randomly in Jordan. I mean, we've gone a long way, like hundreds of kilometers, and we're just like seem to be moving at the same rate. 
Um, yeah, yesterday we were just sitting like in an alleyway, and he goes by in a taxi cab, and he's like his head out the window, like waving at us. And now he just sat down to dinner next to me, and when we were at Petra, he sat down to dinner at us as well. I mean, these are all like completely isolated, random incidences. It's kind of strange, but I mean, we're on kind of the same tourist track in Jordan as he is, and um, so it's not completely impossible, you know. Uh, tomorrow he goes to Syria and we go to Israel, so probably the last time I'm ever going to see No. Okay, so it's 1.30 in the morning and this is just like stupidly loud. But the thing that's interesting is that dancing, which is, the dancing is weird enough in itself, but that's a guy. Like, it's dressed as a chick, it's behaving as a chick, but it's completely, 100% a man. I mean, that is so out of point. Oh, she kissed it, him, it, it just kissed that man. And he looks real excited. Like, this is something you would see in Thailand, but it's really, really out of place here. <laughs> I wish you could see the features of the character as well as I can, but it's just not showing up in the camera. Okay, so our plan for today was to get up and go to Israel. And, um,. Our original plan was to take a five-hour bus all the way to the south of Jordan and then cross over and spend some time in a city down there. But then we did the math on it and it just wasn't very economical. Um, it's actually cheaper to go if we want to go to that town in the south in Israel. It's cheaper to go on the Israeli side. So we're like, oh, screw it. Let's just go straight across from Amman to Jerusalem, which they're like, you know, two hours apart or something, including the border crossing. They're very close. So last night we were up really late because of that transvestite dance party that was going on. Like it didn't end till like 3 30, 4 o'clock. So we ended up staying up really late and then ended up sleeping in until like 9 o'clock. And we got up and started moving and then we went to leave. And the guy was like, Where are you going? And we were like, Oh, we're going to Israel. And he was like, Well, you can't go because the border is closed because it's Friday. <laughs> so it closes early. So. We're in Amman for another day because <laughs> we can't get get across the border. So this is the Hashim place that we've been eating at like every day, the falafel and hummus place, and it is like banging busy. Like all of this, like in the hall, that little room, everything down here, over here. It's basically it's Friday morning, so it's basically like Saturday morning to them or whatever. So that's what's causing it but um, it's making it difficult to get breakfast. <laughs> okay, so it's been two or three days since we put this uh, dead sea water into this little cup to let it evaporate, and it's hard to see in the camera perhaps, but it, the bottom is caked with salt now from the water that has evaporated. And we won't be able to finish the experiment. Uh, I just can't get a good shot. I wish you could see it. Um, there we go, that's not bad. Um, we won't be able to finish the experiment here, but um, we're going to take some water with us and we'll uh, we'll do a larger scale experiment, hopefully at home if we can get it all the way there. But um, it's interesting just to see how much salt is actually in there. Okay, here, really quick, look at this. Um, I'm going to try to do this one-handed, it's hard. I'm going to reach in and I'm just scraping the bottom with my finger. And look at that, how about that for a big glob of salt. Okay, it's March 1st, 2011, so it's been 147 days since we got this water out of the Dead Sea. We managed to smuggle a little bit of it back in one of our small shampoo bottles. Um, you know how they can be funny about having liquids on planes, so we were just a little sly about it. And um, we've had it sitting out since we got back, and as you can see, it's crystallized. Um, the water is kind of like an oil now. It, it's probably gonna be hard to see, but it kind of falls out of the spoon a little at a strange rate. And the salt that has separated feels a lot like ice. Um, it's really thick. Like, it's, I can't break it with this spoon without, you know, muscle. <laughs> and when you pull the, pull it out, uh, it's hard to see on there, but 
Um, it just, yeah, it really does just look like ice. Like, that's, that's, that, that's what we've got. And I guess we'll leave it sit here until there is no water left and we just have a block of solid salt. Um, I sniffed it a minute ago. It doesn't smell like a whole lot of anything. It just smells like, smells like nothing. But I'm definitely not going to taste it. Would you like to taste it? Oh, no. See, I was showing people the, uh, the Dead Sea water and I accidentally drank it, like picked it up and thought it was my drink. Yeah. I, I don't want to do that again, so no. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, if you made it all the way through this video, you're 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 brave. And the remainder of the video is just kind of me. To, I'm, I'm walking up in a mon, and I'm talking about like the strange ball of like emotions and thoughts that were before coming home, like what we were thinking about, and we were talking about this a lot. So um, if you're not interested in hearing about that, then I would say don't watch any more of this video. But if you're actually interested in like what we were thinking about and what we were talking about and how things felt to us at the time, it might be interesting. So, uh, soldier on. These steps are kind of a defining feature of Amon. <laughs> like they run up and down, I'm sorry, I'm climbing over a while. They run up and down the hills, like parallel sort of to streets. So the pedestrians have more of a straight shot. And then people's homes are just kind of right off of the steps. And I just had a massive amount of food, like a ridiculous amount of food. And I had a ridiculously large fruit drink. And I'm just trying to walk off the food. So if I go and lay down right now, I'm going to feel really awful. So <laughs> I'm just finding all the stairs I can and going up them. <laughs> and I'm climbing up to the toppest, highest hill in town. Where... They've got those um, Roman ruins and stuff, and I just want to get a view of them on at nighttime. Whew. Okay, well, this is Amon at night, ugly part of it. And um, I mean, like, compare this to Tokyo, it's kind of funny that this is like a capital city here, and then you think about like the, the night footage from places like Tokyo or Bangkok and stuff, it's completely different, a completely different place. Um, a minute ago, there were actually fireworks in the sky right here. I have no idea what they would be commemorating, but um, they're quite a ways in the distance. Maybe it's a sporting event or something. And you can see there's uh, some more of the city behind me. So I'm sort of centralized from uh, what I can tell. I really don't know the geography that well. And um, these are some of the Roman ruins. And this is that um, building that Katie climbed on top of and then the security guard stood directly below her a couple nights ago. <laughs> <laughs> and she managed to not get in trouble. Um, I'm going to keep my walk. It's actually kind of cold here. Um, not cold, but I mean, with the wind blowing, it's probably in the like, upper 60s. And it feels almost like fall. So it's kind of nice because I really like fall. And it's just, it's just nice to not be blasted with heat. Once the sun comes out, things get really hot. And I mean, I'm sure we're going to have to have that happen before, until we come home. But... Um, it's kind of, it's just nice to have the cold weather. And I'm sure, I mean, by, not, by the time everybody else finds out, or by the time this video gets posted, it'll be, obviously we'll be home, because I'm way behind on editing video right now. But um, we are going to be home on October 22nd, and that's two weeks from today. So it's kind of surreal and strange to be going home, to be honest with you. So it feels a bit like, I mean, we're really tired and we're coming home with like, we're not financially broke or anything. So we're just kind of coming home because we're ready to come home. And home, of course, is Virginia, not that we don't have a home. So we're just going to be living with friends and family for a while. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a really strange, it's a really strange feeling right now because it's just like, Right now, it kind of feels like it's odd because we have a, I have, a, I have, we have a timeline now. It's so strange to feel like. I guess if you don't have that timeline, you feel like you're just going because you feel like it. But now, this timeline is like this is just how I feel at this exact moment. The timeline is kind of like I have to keep going until that point. So it's almost like a sentence, which sounds completely nuts because I know what we're doing is incredible. But I mean, it has been like 405 days, and the exhaustion wearing on us makes it just it almost feels like an eternity to think oh my god two weeks it's gonna take two weeks if we got to go home but i mean i know it's gonna go by quickly and it's gonna be in a completely new country that i've never been to because we're going to israel tomorrow so 
I don't know. It's, it's like a huge ball of strange emotions that are associated with like going back to the States right now. And I mean, we don't have jobs and we don't, <laughs> there's so much, there's so many weird aspects of it. And I mean, we get to go through the explanation of like the same questions over and over we're gonna have to answer, which I mean, it sounds exhaustive right now because all we talk about, because all we have to talk about is a trip between the two of us. I mean, like, all that's happened for the last 400 and some days is, like, travel, 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 travel. So, like, we've run out of things, like, to talk about sometimes. And it's just, like, the thought of having to sit around and talk about traveling with people is just, like, oh, it sounds like... <laughs> it just sounds really exhausting. Like, I just want to sit around and play video games. And if I could, like, go straight into a job and just have, like, a daily routine without, like, all the headaches that come around with that, I would love to do that, but like we want to, we want to go see my family, and my family now lives in Oregon, and Katie's family is in Virginia, so we'll be flying into Virginia, and then it's like we want to spend Thanksgiving with them, so that's like a month. So, but after that, we want to drive to Oregon to see my family. So it's not like we can just get jobs. Like, you can't get a job and be like, okay, well, in a month I need a month off, or like you know, it doesn't work. So. I mean, I have a lot of video to edit, and I've got a lot of things like trip-based projects and things, and I just want to play some video games. So, I mean, I, I can kill a month, and I'm going to be going to a friend's house and spending some time there, and that should be cool. But, like, I don't like sitting around and doing nothing. Like, that's not in my personality. So, to think of a month of things with nothing, nothing to do is just kind of crazy. That's hard to wrap my mind around. I don't know. I could talk for a real long time about like the feelings of going home and I don't have any idea if it's going to be like accurate or not or you know I, I don't know really what it's going to be like so it's um kind of like nerve-wracking in a way. Um, another quick angle that I thought of that I've talked about this as well with other people it's like when we go home we're going to just drop right right back into where we left like it's like like our lives at home got paused we went and did this and then we came back and it's like unpausing it and everybody else's life at home continued to go right so it's like we're gonna go back and all of a sudden dynamics have shifted and things have changed but our situation really hasn't so to me that's just kind of like I'm wondering if that's gonna be odd and like on the other hand we've gone and done like a million things and everybody else at home has not done like it made us look like nothing has changed and I mean that could be a weird feeling as well so it's so strange like it's like it's like a thousand different things that you think about that all contradict each other and that's kind of like what I feel like about going back to the states so it should be strange to say the least and hopefully by February <laughs> I'll have a job but um, I'll quit blabbling on and this may have gotten cut so we'll uh, we'll see how things roll I like how people see me walking on the street talking to the camera and they look at me like I'm insane. So, I mean, maybe. You know. <laughs>